Welcome to Beauty Times Medicine, Galderma's video and podcast series that keeps you informed about the latest innovations in dermatology and aesthetic medicine. Joining us today is Dr. Jean Carudas, a true pioneer in aesthetic medicine. She's been called the godmother of cosmetic dermatology, and it's no exaggeration to say that she has completely reshaped the field. Based in Vancouver, Canada, Dr. Carudas and her late husband, Dr. Alistair Carudas, were the first to explore the aesthetic use of neuromodulators, an idea that has since grown into the most commonly performed non-surgical cosmetic procedure in the world. Dr. Karudas is an award-winning researcher and author of over 300 peer-reviewed scientific publications, 70 book chapters, and nine textbooks. She's also a clinical professor at the University of British Columbia's Department of Ophthalmology and remains at the cutting edge of innovation. Dr. Karudas, it's such an honor to have you on the show today. Well, the honor is mine. Okay. So, the audience may be a bit surprised to learn that you're actually an ophthalmologist by training, mm -hmm. and your breakthrough in aesthetic medicine actually came from a totally different condition in a totally different field. Please tell us a bit about that. I had just had my third son, and Alistair let me know that he had a fellowship in San Francisco. Uh, on Mohs surgery, on skin cancer surgery, because there was an epidemic. So I arranged a fellowship for myself with Dr. Alan Scott at the Smith Kettlewell Institute of Visual Sciences in San Francisco, because he was using botulinum toxin to straighten misaligned eyes, strabismus. And later in my fellowship, he started using it to treat blepharospasm, which is a terrible condition where patients' eyes are spasm shut, they can't cross the street, drive a car, earn a living, and several days after they've had the treatment, they're back to being normal sighted people again. A miracle. So I did my fellowship with Alan, and I joined his NIH study, which was a multi-center worldwide study to treat blepharospasm, hemifacial spasm, uh, spastic lower eyelid entrophion and strabismus. And so I brought it back to Canada and was approved by Health Canada uh, to start the study uh, in May of 1983. So it was one of my blepharospasm patients who actually got angry at me. And I have to tell you how unusual that was. Oh, she got angry at you for treating She got angry at me, but normally blepharospasm patients are like, so grateful to have their eyes open so they can function again. And she was angry, so I really paid attention. You always should listen to your patients, but even more if they're upset. She said, you didn't treat me here. And I said, I'm so sorry. She's pointing at, pointing at her medial brows. Oh, wow. And I apologized to her and said, I hadn't thought you were spasming there. And she said, oh, I know I'm not spasming there. But every time you treat me there, I get this beautiful, untroubled expression. But then it made sense to me because Alistair had told me that he was having trouble treating deep frown lines between the eyes with collagen, fibril, and autologous fat. And so I went home that night, and we have three sons, and over a chaotic dinner, I said, you know, we should do a study together. And there's chaos all around with the kids. And uh, so the next morning, because in those days we shared an office, our receptionist had very deep frown lines, which became amazingly deep by three in the afternoon. Okay. <laughs> but you so know, we had your, maybe your first uh, patient here. She was going to be our first patient because she was unusual because all the other patients in our first published study would say, oh, no, I don't think so. It's a poison. I don't want to have anything to do with that. Where Kathy was totally relaxed about it. So she became our first patient. But when you started talking to other physicians about it, weren't they a bit shocked, botulinum toxin? Uh, I would imagine people felt, wow, is this uh, safe? What are you doing there? What was the reaction? That was exactly the reaction okay. of the physicians. 
And even when we gave the first paper, which was, which I gave, which was the first 18 patients that we had uh, treated at the American Society for Derm Surgery annual meeting, I usually get questions and people coming up and asking me about things. This time the room was dead silent, nothing. This was too shocking for them. Too shocking. But afterwards they came up and they said, how could you do that? How could you use that terrible poison on something so frivolous as a wrinkle? And that was the thing that they hadn't been doing the study, the NIH study with Alan Scott. They didn't understand the dosing. They didn't understand the anatomy, which we had studied carefully. And they also thought that wrinkles were frivolous. Okay, so they, they thought this was not what you should be using. Uh, it was almost too good to be true, or they just thought it was frivolous? They just thought it was dangerous and okay. frivolous, and that they thought I was a really nice person, but they now began to think I might be crazy. And <laughs> someone whispered to me that maybe you even had to treat yourself to create yeah. proof. Is that true? True. True. Because when it came to getting the patients enrolled in that study, uh, they would say that, oh, I don't want it, it's a poison. And I would show them then the picture of me before, because I used to have some frown lines. And then I'd say, what do you think? And I'd sweep my bangs back. And they look and they say, oh, do it. Because they could see I was perfectly healthy and I had no frown lines left and had some decent ones before. And that's exactly what they wanted. So that's how I learned in this world, people don't do what you tell them to, they do what you do. And how did it uh, work out that people started seeing the commercial opportunity here? Was this uh, you presented to companies or how did that work out? It actually worked out because Allergan had bought the rights from Alan Scott uh, for the use of Botox, which was called oculinum. That's what he had called it. And it was just a question of it starting to be a thing because the actual demographics were with us because the baby boomers were born 1946 to 64. So now we're in the late 80s. So now the boomers are starting to get to be 40, and now they're time crunched between looking after their aging family and looking after their growing children. So this was a perfect thing for them to look better, feel better, and not have to spend a lot of time in surgical recovery. So it actually caught on because of the boomers. So I recently saw you on stage in Paris at IMCAS, and there the talk was about a new generation of neuromodulators, uh, liquidized. So what do you think some of the advantages of these neuromodulators? Well, this particular one seems to have a faster onset, and it seems to last a long time. In the photographs at six months, the uh, treatment still has not worn off. Uh, in the glabella and the lateral canthal lines. So I think those will be attractive features. The fact that it's already uh, pre-liquidized, if you will, and ready for injection, I think will make a lot of difference to busy practices that don't have to have staff come in early in order to mix up the product. And I think there'll be uh, maybe less possibility of people maybe mixing it incorrectly. So you can actually trust what the dose is. But have you ever imagined that uh, uh, neuromodulator would be basically the base treatment in a static medicine? When you started off, did you think that would ever be possible? No, I didn't have any idea that that would happen. But I became uh, aware that patients were very much coming back for these treatments. And so it really is not just that they look better, it's that they feel better. And I think that's a really important new transition uh, in our world that I think cosmetic is now tipping over into the wellness world so that people are really starting to understand the effects not only on beauty, but also on social anxiety disorder and self-esteem and depression. Having all your experiences still being incredibly active, are you positive about the evolution in the static medicine and the neuromodulation, or do you think there's uh, the best days have already happened, what you said? <laughs> well, I think some great days have already happened, but I think the best days are here to come. 
because really we're just in kindergarten. We just walked into the room and flicked on the light switch. And now we're starting to see where we can really go. The fact that you were a true pioneer, what gave you the strength when people were doubting whether this was frivolous or this was not safe? What gave you the strength through all of this to stay the course? Of course, today, well, everybody knows the incredible success of neuromodulators, but back then it must have felt a bit lonely at times, I would imagine. It wasn't really lonely because Alistair and I both understood it. That was the really great thing, that he understood it and was really, really keen to see it fly as well. So that was easy. And then uh, the other thing is that we discovered that the dermatologists actually have open minds. Uh, my ophthalmologists were more, well, we've got surgery. We don't really need that. So, but the dermatologists were excited. And Alistair was the one who really got it going in the American Academy of Dermatology. I think the first breakfast meeting he gave, there were half a dozen people. And the next year it was 50. And the next year it was 700. You know, I think that that's really a group that um, really can understand science and how it can really best be applied to their patients. Well, Dr. Karudas, I, I think uh, saying it's been a privilege is a dramatic understatement to hear all your great insights, but also how you got the idea and the, the fact that you're still very, very uh, active in advancement of neuromodulation. And, uh, I think everybody in this field owe you a big amount of gratitude for everything you've done. So not only thank you so much for being on the show, but also for everything you've done to, I think, it's not too small to say to revolutionize this field. So thank you so much. Well, thank you so much for doing all the great things that you're doing to advance it. And it's my honor and pleasure to be here with you. Thank you so much. So thank you for joining us for this episode of Beauty Times Medicine. We're excited to bring you more fascinating stories and expert insights from the world of dermatology and aesthetic medicine. Be sure to follow us on Galderma's social media channels and Spotify for more episodes and updates, stay tuned.